the family of God. We should use this beautiful love story to remind ourselves that through faith in Jesus Christ, we become spiritual brothers and sisters. Here's Dr. Jean Getz to explain. Look at Ruth chapter 4, final chapter in this little book, verse 13. Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he was intimate with her, and when was he intimate with her? When she became his wife. There's another reinforcement of that principle that sex is designed by God for this marriage relationship. So Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and when he was intimate with her, the Lord enabled her to conceive. She gave birth to a son. We go on to verses 16 and 17. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and here's the grandmother now in this cultural situation taking care of him. We don't know all the dynamics, but Frequently in this culture, the grandmother was very much involved in the situation. The neighbor woman said to Naomi, A son has been born to Naomi. In other words, this is more than just a son to Ruth. This is to the grandmother. And they named him Obed, which is short for Obadiah. See, they even had their nicknames back then. Rather than Richard Dick or uh, some other nickname, uh, here is Obed, Obadiah. A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse. This is very significant because Jesse was the father of David. And here is that messianic line that God is superintending in this situation. Because from David came what we frequently call as the greater David, the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born into this world. Not as a person born of normal birth, but conceived by the Holy Spirit, but through the channel of Mary, the Virgin Mary. Finally, we read in verse 22, And Obed, again, fathered Jesse, who fathered David. See, the author wants us to know that. And so, he repeats this particular uh, scenario. And, and when you go to the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, what we have is a repeat. Matthew 1, verse 1, the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of whom? David. The son of Abraham, going all the way back. And later we read in verses 5 and 6, Solomon fathered Boaz by whom? Rahab. Who was Rahab? Rahab was the harlot, the pagan, Canaanite harlot in Jericho. Boaz, Solomon fathered Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. See, those names are very significant in God's providential plan. And it's not an accident that in this genealogy of Jesus Christ, we have people out of all kinds of backgrounds, whether Gentile or Jewish, whether pagan or following Yahweh. See, Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of the world. And even in His genealogy, He represents the world, all groups, all people, and, uh, and, and you can't miss that, and that's a very significant thing. And yet, through this line, which was contaminated, which involves harlotry, which involves paganism, which involves people who worship false gods like Ruth, no matter what the situation, whether it's Judah and some of the horrible things that he did, there is this line that God superintended that still gave birth to the spotless and sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ, through the Virgin Mary. Fascinating story. That just didn't happen by accident. This is why we call uh, this providence. We see in, the, in Ruth, we see God's providence, a principle of God's providence. And God's 
superintendency in this situation. Now, the Family Redeemer is a very interesting, fascinating situation here in this whole story. Uh, we jumped over that somewhat, but, but basically this was, uh, we talked about it. But when it comes to Jesus, we have an eternal family redeemer. And in many respects, we see this illustrated in the book of Ruth. We see this illustrated with the family redeemer in Israel that God had designed, pointing to the great eternal family redeemer. Redeemer, and that's Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, In Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And what you see from Genesis to Revelation is an unfolding of God's wisdom and understanding, God's providential plan. From Adam and Eve, to the failure, to sin entering the world, to the family that became horribly dysfunctional with Cain and Abel. We see these spurts of, of change through Noah, and then back into sin. We see with Abraham, back into sin. Again, the world deteriorating. We see God choosing Abraham out of paganism biggest illustration of grace in the Old Testament. He was a pagan. God selected him, chose him, Sarah his wife, both pagans, idolaters, and through them promised that they would have a land, a seed, a blessing. The land was Canaan. The seed was the children of Israel, through whom would come the blessing, and that's Jesus Christ, and that's the family redeemer. And that's the story, basically, of the Bible. And so we are a part of the family of God. And, and that's a very important principle, Romans 12, 10. We have a very significant directive here, and that is we're to show family affection to one another with brotherly love. We are believers, and we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We are that extended family that we've already talked about tonight, even in caring for those who are in need. And we're to outdo one another in showing honor. So here we have this beautiful picture coming out of this story of Ruth, the eternal family redeemer, Jesus Christ. And so the question that I'd like to leave with you tonight, whether you're here in this room or whether you're watching on the internet or wherever you hear this message in what other form, if you have not experienced God's redeeming grace by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your family redeemer, please do so today by sincerely praying the following prayer. And a lot of people will say, what do you mean? How can I, how can I know this family redeemer? How can I know this Savior? How can I know what you're talking about? How can I have eternal life? How can I enter into this experience? Well, it's simple but profound. I've worded this prayer, and I'd like you to read it with me, and then reflect on it. Dear God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for sending your Son to be my personal Savior from sin. I confess that I have sinned, and I now receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Thank you for coming into my life. Amen. And let me just unpack that just a little. I wanted you to read that through with me. I wanted you to get the concept. But basically what it's saying is you're acknowledging God, who is the Father of the Lord Jesus, who sent Jesus to die for us. You are thanking Him for sending His Son, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should receive eternal life. You're thanking Him for sending His Son to be your personal Savior. He died for you. Because you can plug your name into John 3.16, for God so loved Gene, for God so loved David, Bob, Melody, 
Mike, Sharon, God so loved each one of us. He died for each one of us. And that's why salvation has to be personal. It's a personal experience. It's not something that my parents do for me. It's not something that comes to me when I'm baptized as a baby or baptized as an adult. It's not something that I receive when I go to church. It's something that I receive when I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Now you notice it says, I confess that I've sinned. And we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Some people say, well, I'm not so bad. But have you sinned? Have you fallen short of God's glory? If you say that you haven't sinned, you're saying you're like God. You're perfect. There's not one of us that hasn't fallen short of God's glory, of who He is and all of His holiness. So we have sinned, and the wages of that sin is death, spiritual death. So I confess that I've sinned, and I now, and here's the key, I now receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. In John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, He came to His own, His own people, the Jewish nation, but His own didn't receive Him as a nation. Many received Him personally, but as to those who received Him, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become, the son of, to become sons of God, who receive Him, who believe in Him, who trust Him. And so this statement says, I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Thank you for coming into my life. Amen. If you pray that prayer, and you pray it personally, and you pray it sincerely, you have eternal life. This moment. He will come into your life and begin to change your life. And that's the miracle of the new birth. That's why we call it the new birth. Nicodemus was confused by that when Jesus said, you must be born again. Can you enter your mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, that's not what I'm talking about. This is spiritual birth. Becoming a new creation in Jesus Christ. So, if you haven't prayed that prayer sincerely with me as we've read it, I trust as soon as we say amen, that you will. At this moment, or very shortly, even before you leave this room, or before you turn off your computer, or whatever instrument you're using to hear this message, that you'll become one of God's children at this moment.